huge thank you to Case Filters for sponsoring this week's video. In this episode, I show you how to shoot dramatic storm time lapses, night sky sequences, and various tricks and tips for landscape photography. I really hope you enjoy watching. These are some really amazing clouds. And I think I'm gonna set up some time lapses of these really thunderous cells that are, they look like they're heading north. Just these cloud textures, uh, they're really some of my favorite things to photograph and a time lapse. And I just love the movement you get when you speed up the motion and you can see all the billowing. So that's what I have uh, focused on right here. I've got the 28 to 200 millimeter lens on here. Let me show you what I am staring at real quick. So there is the storm cloud in all its glory. You can see there's a bit of haze just because this is midday light. But in order to take care of the haze, I use a polarizer. And watch what happens when I twist this polarizer. You're just gonna see all this richness and contrast. Oof, there we go. Looks so much more dramatic with the polarizer. You can see if you shoot it wide, you get the whole storm cloud, which could be cool. But then we could also zoom in here pick out little individual sections of the clouds that also look really cool. The big difference in composing a time-lapse sequence versus a still photograph is really anticipating the motion. So you really have to anticipate exactly where the clouds are gonna move or what motion is gonna happen through the scene. All right, I think it's worth doing just an overall shot here real quick. So showing the whole textured cloud here Make sure we're on manual focus. Very important we're on manual focus for the time lapse so that it doesn't shift during the time lapse. And a lot of people ask me if I do aperture priority mode or manual. Since the lighting isn't gonna change too much, I do manual. Um, and even during sunset and sunrise, I also like to do manual mode. And then just at sunset, overexpose the scene right until I'm clipping the highlights. And then as the time lapse runs, it gets darker and darker, but usually not too dark to, uh, you know, not be able to bring up some of the shadows and some of the highlights. And then vice versa at sunrise, you'll want to really under expose the scene because you know that that light is coming in. Um, there are applications for aperture priority mode, like if you want to shoot a cityscape going from sunset into nighttime and you're shooting for, you know, an hour to two hours, aperture priority mode is the way to go. But in most of these scenes, I just find that manual does the trick. And in order to trigger the time lapse, I'm gonna use the interval shoot mode here in the Sony. If you're using Nikon or Canon, you probably also have this function. Uh, most of the newer cameras have a time lapse function built into them, which is fantastic. It's so nice not having to use a remote anymore. If you don't, if you have an older camera, you're gonna to need to buy what's called an intervalometer. And this basically is just a little device that triggers your camera's shutter every second or two seconds or whatever you happen to set as you, the time in between each photo. Interval, I think two seconds would be good for this. Basically, general rule of thumb on interval, the faster something is moving, the faster you want your interval to be. So if I saw the clouds moving right in front of me, well, it's probably best to do a one second interval. But if I don't see any movement at all and I can barely even tell, are they even going anywhere? Two to three seconds is probably gonna work better for you depending on how much motion you want and how much time you have to shoot the time-lapse. Number of shots, let's do 500 for this. F6.3, ISO 100. One reason why I like to keep my aperture low at 6.3 is because the higher your aperture is, the more chance of seeing dust spots you'll have. So if you have a ton of dust spots on your sensor and you shoot F16 as a time lapse, you're gonna see a lot of those dust spots. And trust me, they are not fun to remove out of a time lapse. They're easy to remove out of a still photo. You try doing that to another four or 500 photos, a lot of weird stuff can happen. So I'm gonna click start, let the camera roll, see how this turns out. Should be really nice though. So 
So again, a huge thank you to Case Filters for sponsoring this video. I've been using their magnetic filter system for the last four years, and they've quickly become my favorite filter kit that I've ever used. The main reason for that is they are super lightweight and thin, super easy to take on and off the camera, and produce great quality without any color shifts. So if you're in the market for a new kit, I highly recommend checking these out. Link in the description. In my filter pouch, I also have an ND64 filter and an ND1000, and I will use these filters to knock down my shutter speed while I'm doing certain time lapses, mainly for time lapses that include water or quick moving objects like people and cars. Oftentimes it's a good idea to do a long exposure to smooth out that motion. Just make sure if you do decide to do a long exposure that it doesn't exceed your interval. After shooting those time lapses, I decided to pull out the 100 to 400 lens to do a few cloud close-ups. And here's how those turned out. It was really fun to play around with some of the beautiful textures and patterns here. And for these photographs, I just shot these handheld, making sure that my shutter speed was double the focal length. All right, so I decided to shift my time-lapse attention to another scene. Absolutely incredible. You get this entire mountain range, Lone Pine Peak in the middle. Mount Whitney over there, all this symmetry. You know, I think right about there, so that I'm just a touch wider than what I want, and then I could always crop in later if I feel like this is too wide. I just don't wanna have not enough room and then feel like the composition is cramped later on. So I'm gonna use the same settings as before, 1 500th of a second. Make sure my polarizer is twisted to get all that richness and contrast to the scene. I am really excited to see how this one turns out. Absolutely love this. There's more of these storm clouds pushing in too. I wonder how that's gonna affect the lighting and the time lapse. That could be a very, a good or a bad thing. We'll have to see. It's very dark over there. So to be honest with you, this time lapse ended up a bit uneventful. I definitely thought it was going to be more interesting while I was shooting it. And this definitely happens when you're shooting time lapses, because really the outcome can be a bit of a surprise, even when you think you've anticipated the motion. And even though I would have loved this to turn out a little bit more interesting, I think that's part of the fun of it is not knowing exactly how it's going to turn out. After this, I got a beautiful sunset, and then luckily the sky opened up enough to see the Milky Way. biggest questions I get asked is how to shoot a Milky Way time lapse. And really it's very simple. The key is to just let in as much light as possible. Generally I'm using a wide lens like a 14mm or 16mm to show as much of the sky as possible. And then I shoot a 20 second exposure, f2.8, and ISO 3200 to ISO 12800. And then I'll usually let my camera run overnight for at least four hours to see all that motion in the sky. One thing that's very important to remember is since your exposure is so long, 20 seconds, that time is going to add to your overall interval. So if my shutter speed is 20 seconds, then in my intervalometer, I'm going to want to set 21 seconds so that there's that one second buffer time and I don't run into any issues with missing frames. Earlier in the video I mentioned aperture priority mode, and here's a shot from my trip that I used that setting for. And the reason for that is I ended up just letting this time lapse run for about an hour and a half while I ran off to take some other photographs. What I do is set my camera to aperture priority mode, and then I'll usually take down the EV meter by about one third of a stop, and I find that for my Sony, multimeter works great. One of the problems with aperture priority mode that is less of a problem now, but definitely used to be a huge problem years back, was flicker. This is usually a problem with the light meter getting confused at the light entering the camera's sensor and giving you inconsistent lighting values in your frames. It's pretty easy to remove in post. There's a dedicated effect right in DaVinci Resolve, which I find works really great, but if you want to dive even further into time-lapse editing, deflickering, and color grading, I recommend checking out LR Time Lapse. This is a software that runs directly with Lightroom and allows you to animate the color grades of your Lightroom adjustments. You can also deflicker and export the time lapses right out of that software.
got some pretty intense clouds coming towards us and uh, well that oftentimes means it's going to be a pretty exciting evening um, I've just been kind of hanging out at one of my favorite views of the eastern sierras which uh, gives you this just incredible incredible perspective on the mountain range and here let me instead of talking about it maybe i'll just show you real quick so check out that view so you can see on the left side we have lone pine peak which is just such a beautiful kind of pyramid shape peak and then of course right there right there we have the iconic mount whitney so before it got too stormy, I actually did manage to get these mountains with a bit of light on them, and here's how that time lapse turned out. You know what? I think I see some birds flying around. Switch to 200 millimeters here. Yep, there they are. Okay, make sure bump my ISO a bit. Make sure my shutter speed is high enough to compensate. There we go. Nice. I've photographed this mountain countless times and I feel like every single time I come back here I'm always treated with something new. And I definitely lucked out with getting this bird right smack dab in the middle of Mount Whitney here. After photographing this one I decided to wander to another area to see if I could get sunset. But the dramatic storm clouds had other plans. <laughs> well, initially I was going to shoot sunset here but uh, it is really dark and confidence is low that the light is even going to get through here. So just look at this foreground right here. It's so cool. And then it leads right up into this little spiky peak. So I can either do a panorama like this, or if I flip the camera vertically, I can almost get the whole thing. Right now you're seeing a 16 by 9 crop, so it would be a little bit wider than this. But I just love this kind of triangle shape you get and then the peak in the in the background and even over there there's some really cool perspectives of this rock just so many different leading lines and patterns to play with so i think let's let's go over there and see if you know fingers crossed we get a sunset this is so cool in here we've got all these rocks and then amongst the rocks you have these little these little white flowers it's really cool from this angle you kind of split the the formation into two which is interesting and of course if i pull back here you can see how that changes the foreground shape but there's just a lot of different ways to compose this so it's worth kind of moving around the foreground here, even getting down here a little bit closer. And really, I, I say it all the time in these videos, but you know, the wide angle lens is all about movement. It's all about you physically moving your position in the camera. So, you know, like any type of photography, it takes time to scout and play around and definitely not getting light now. It's, it's after sunset and unfortunately that that didn't happen, but uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll come back here for better light another time, but you know, it's just one of those things. At least, even if you didn't get a shot, at least it's something you can make a mental note for, for next time. Sure enough, I wandered back here with my friend Josh Cripps and got some way better light to work with. So this was a vertical panorama of three horizontal frames, one for the sky, one for the horizon, and then one for that foreground pattern. I really love all the symmetry here and that color contrast between the bluish tones in the sky and the warmth in the rock. Mm -hmm. 
If you want to learn how I edit my time lapses, I'm going to go ahead and leave links to that at the end of this video. I also offer one on one workshops and tutorials, which are all on my website, link in the description. With that, I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did enjoy it, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel for more. And yeah, I'll catch you in the next one. Thank you.